to build awesome REST APIs with Symfony 2. Uh, if you have any question during this presentation, please raise your hand and we'll try to answer your question. Or if we can't answer in a short amount of time, we'll postpone the question to, to the end of the talk. All right. So yeah, I'm, I'm Lucas, um, and uh, I guess I'll start off here. Um, and um, actually during this talk, we'll introduce a bunch of bundles uh, for Symfony 2. The first one being uh, JMS Serializer, which is really a key component when you're building REST APIs with Symfony 2. Um, I should mention, actually, I was a co-author of the Serializer component within Symfony 2, uh, and that is a quite capable solution as well, but the JMS Serializer bundle is way more powerful. Uh, more specifically, um, uh, with JMS Serializer, you have a very powerful tool to serialize object graphs. So really, with JMS Serializer, you want to work with objects. Um, and so if you have a collection, you shouldn't use an array. You should actually have a collection object and things like that. But once you have that, you have a very powerful way of adding mapping annotations to the different properties and the different classes uh, to have a really expressive way of leveraging both JSON and XML to their full potential. And I'll, I'll actually have an example in a second. Um, there are a lot of different extension points with JMS Serializer, and that is really what sets it apart from the core Serializer from Symfony 2. So um, essentially what um, the, the library underneath the, uh, the bundle uses is what's called a visitor pattern. So it just goes to that object graph and allows you to hook in custom visitors that then change the default behavior. So you, you can not only, for example, serialize JSON, but also JSON-LD, which is a uh, um, linked data format on top of JSON, similar to RDF, and things like that with custom visitors. Um, and the other cool thing or extension point that, uh, that people use quite a lot are what is called exclusion strategies. So by default, um, JMS Serializer just tries to serialize all the properties. But you know, one of the standard exclusion strategies is just to say, by default, don't serialize anything. And actually, I have to explicitly enable which uh, properties to expose. There are other custom strategies, like to what depth the object graph should be serialized. You can say. Um, serialize everything up to a depth of two uh, and things like that. And you can, of course, create your own custom exclusion strategies. So let's have a look at an example um, class that you might want to serialize. So this is um, you know, just a custom class that you created. You know, it can be um, a model uh, that you know, you're, you're storing in Doctrine or Propel or anything like that. It can also come out of anywhere else. You just have any type of uh, PHP class and you can either use annotations, you can use XML, or you can use uh, YAML for the, the mapping. In code examples, it's always kind of convenient to use annotations, so that's what I'm using here. Um, although, actually, I, I, I tend to use annotations quite a bit in the applications I write as well. Um, so what you can see here is basically um, you add a few annotations to your code. So the, the, the first one here is serializer XML root. As you can see in the name, that's only for XML. And that basically uh, specifies what tag to use uh, for, uh, for this class. And all the properties are tags contained within the response tag. For JSON, you don't need this. And that's why um, this is really XML specific. Now, the next two bits are, again, Actually, the annotations are, again, XML specific. And that's because in this example, we, would, we are assuming that we're using an exclusion strategy that just, or we're disabling a, an exclusion strategy, so all the properties are mapped. Now, on the articles, this is a, sort of an array of values. And here, again, we can, uh, we can really leverage XML's full potential. And the first parameter we have in this XML list annotation is we say inline. So instead of having like an articles tag and then they're in having multiple article tags, what we end up with is just three articles tags uh, within the response tag. And uh, the name of the tag, that's defined by this entry. Um, then the next thing that we have is the page property. And here we say uh, this is an XML property. And uh, so let me briefly show you how that, uh, that looks if we serialize that to JSON. So with JSON, we just get the list of articles, um, you know, just as an array, and then a page um, in there as well. But if we look at how that looks in an XML, we end up seeing that the page becomes an, an attribute, and the articles actually are, are, are tags inlined into the response. 
And I think that is another significant difference between the core serializer in Symfony 2 and the JMS serializer. In the JMS serializer, you can really have the same uh, object graph and serialize that to different formats and have and use the full potential of the format. With that, whereas with the um, core serializer, which is more working with arrays, you actually would have to have a different array structure to get this type of output um, for XML and for JSON. So that's a, that's a key difference there. All right, so we will see that pretty much all the bundles that we're going to talk about next, they're actually using the JMS serializer. Um, um, and so it's really important to get familiar with that. Um, there's pretty good documentation on it um, on the, the author's website. Uh, but it's, especially if we start to get to, to the extending point, it can get a little bit complex, but nowadays, at least for exclusion strategies, for visitor patterns, there are lots of examples uh, out there um, to get started with. Now, the next bundle I want to talk about is the FOSRES bundle, um, and that is sort of a, um, a bundle that pulls together lots of different um, tools, um, and sort of, you can consider it sort of a toolbox of use at will features. Um, so um, the idea uh, that the bundle provides is that you can more efficiently, more quickly create uh, REST APIs with Symfony 2. Um, one of the things it adds is a, more of like a proper view layer. So in Symfony 2, usually in your controller, you would go straight to a template, or you would go straight to um, you know, serializing something to JSON. And uh, with this bundle, you can optionally sort of have a layer in between um, that allows you to uh, write controllers and controller actions that um, can at the same time be used to generate HTML output from a template and uh, also generate XML or JSON output uh, for REST APIs. Um, another nice feature of the bundle is that um, within your controllers, there's actually a way of... Um, uh, an, or a naming convention that it looks at the action names and based on the action names it automatically generates you the route uh, uh, definitions so you don't need to manually write out all the routes. Um, so that makes everything a little bit faster in sort of getting started but more importantly also it ensures that you have a consistent naming strategy across all your routes for your collections and, and properties and things like that. Um, there's some, uh, another feature is um, you can actually have a way uh, to validate and uh, add defaults for get parameters because in the core routing system you can, um, you can define placeholder within your patterns and you can define defaults for these but you cannot really cover get parameters as well. So um, there is a set of annotations you can use with the REST bundle to also do parsing and validation on those. Then obviously it integrates with the JMS serializer but it, you can also use the core serializer if you prefer to. Um, I would generally recommend to use the JMS serializer, however. It also provides integration with the Sensio Framework Extra Bundle. That means that parameter converters are supported. Um, and then there's also integration for, um, so instead of having to return a response from your action, you can also just re return um, just an object, and then that uh, will trigger a listener that will automatically convert that to a response. That's a feature provided by the Sensio Framework Extra Bundle, and we've just integrated, integrated that into... Um, the FOSRES bundle. Now, another thing that it, it supports is just a bunch of different listeners to, to add uh, some behaviors. The, the, uh, probably the, the most important one is for accept header negotiation, and I actually will get to that in a little bit more detail uh, in just a minute. Um, then also request body decoding, so for example, sending a JSON message, um, it can automatically get decoded to an array and placed into the request object. Same thing for XML and so on. That is supported. And then we just have, I don't know, there are like, I think probably like six or seven different listeners that you can choose to enable or disable um, to add more uh, features. So let me um, show you an example controller here. Um, obviously, you could also extend from base controller, but in this example, I just have a, a plain uh, class that is not in, uh, extending anything. As you can see here, the, the naming of the method is quite significant. So here we can see it's called get articles action. And what that means is that this will generate um, uh, a, a pattern where um, it's basically going to work on, uh, for it's basically the, the getter for the articles collection. Um, so if in the um, 
up here you see the, the URL that is generated. You can have like a prefix here um, that's just added, but then it's just articles um, for the collection. If this method would be called get article action, then it would be slash articles slash and then uh, in uh, curly brackets ID. That would be the getter uh, for a specific article. Um, then uh, because this method starts with get, it's actually going to set a requirement on uh, the HTTP method being get. So if you would want to do a post, you would call this post articles action or for put, put articles action. Now, um, yeah, so that's, that's basically handled from the method name. Now, um, there are two other things that we can see here. This is the query param annotation here. So with this, we're saying that um, actually there's a query parameter. So this is actually not part of the, the URL pattern, as we can see up here. But there's a qu query parameter called page. It needs to be um, uh, a non-empty uh, string with uh, just digits. And if it's, if it's missing, then we'll default that to one. And as you can see, um, even though it's not part of the pattern, then you can also inject the page parameter here um, as within the method signature. Normally, you would have to actually get the request object, then in the request object called get page to get that value, validate that it is, in fact, an integer, um, or that it's empty, and then set the default. So here, this is a much more cleaner way. and um, to specify that sort of thing. Now, the other thing that's interesting here is that, as you can see, we're not returning a proper response. So this is the response class that I showed you earlier for the serializer. And um, because we're using this um, add view annotation, it basically means that um, we are, we're using a, a, um, a listener from the Sensio Framework Extra Bundle that will then convert that to a response based on a naming convention. Um, so the interesting bit is that um, with this, with this Sensio Framework Extra um, uh, listener is that it applies a naming convention to determine the name of the template that you want to use with Twig automatically. So it's going to look at the name of the controller and strip that off. So it's going to, um, in the resources views directory, there's, uh, you need to create a, a rest directory. And under that, you will have to have a template called getarticles_action.html.twig. And that's what it's going to use if you're rendering HTML. Now, what is really cool about this is that this action here will actually work to render both HTML, JSON, and XML. So if you're requesting uh, an HTML response, then it will use the template to render that out. If you're requesting uh, a JSON response, it will actually go directly to the JMS serializer and generate the JSON response for you. So with one action, you can cover both your REST API and your HTML API at the same time. So it could genera generate that HTML based on a Twig template. You know? But it could also generate the JSON or XML response I showed earlier. All right. Um, so now I will have a short excursion on something, and I hope I can get it across sufficiently within a short amount of time. Because we, when we were debating how to do the presentation, we were thinking, OK, do we need to talk about REST in detail or not? Um, and I assume many of you are familiar with some of the REST principles, and others are here because they want to hear about that. And uh, you know, we're trying to find uh, sort of a, a common denominator, and we figured that this is a very important topic to explain. Um, so here, here knows the term content type negotiation. Could you briefly just raise your hand? Okay, so that's maybe a fourth, maybe not even. Okay, so it's a good idea, I guess, that we cover this. So many people, when you know, when they're doing uh, REST APIs and things like that, or they believe that they're doing REST APIs, what they end up doing is. They're differentiating between HTML and JSON or XML as a response by adding .json or .xml to their pattern uh, um, in the routes, right? And that is a you know a very quick way to actually be able to uh, differentiate what the user might want as a response. The problem with that is that technically the URI should be a unique identifier to a given resource. So if you're saying that um, that you have a pattern articles.json, it actually is something different. You're identifying something different than articles.html. So to a client from the outside, um, 
you're not providing them a unique identifier anymore. They need to know that um, if they're asking for this resource, um, that they need to add .json um, in order to get the JSON response. Uh, and um, so that can, that can cause problems with, with outside clients relying on the URL working as a unique identifier. And then that way, if you look at the dissertation uh, by Fielding, he's saying this is, uh, you should not use file extensions to communicate what the, uh, the response format should be. Instead, what you should use is what is called media types. Um, so with media types, you can identify what representation that you want. So um, application slash JSON would be, I want to get JSON back, or text slash HTML would be, I want to get HTML back. Um, you can even create your own custom media types if you want to say, okay, this is JSON, but it's not standard JSON. This is JSON that follows a very specific type of structure. Um, so you can create your own uh, custom types. And if you do that, then usually what you should do is put that under the application slash vnd dot and then whatever you want uh, um, sort of media type namespace. Um, there are two headers that you will use for communicating uh, media types. The first one is content type. So this is sort of the, the, the message format that you're sending. So for example, if you want to send JSON to Symphony 2 and then automatically have that decoded by the body decoder listener, then you would have to set the proper content type so that uh, uh, the first rest bundle can know, okay, this is JSON, so I need to co decode that with a JSON decoder, or this is XML. The other bit um, is the accept header. With the accept header, you're communicating what you would like to get back as a response format. Um, and in this accept header, um, let's have a brief look at, um, actually, okay, let me skip that. Anyway, so this is up here is an example of um, an accept header. So we say uh, application JSON uh, is something that we're willing to deal with. We're willing to deal with application XML. Um, text HTML works too or actually any text, and um, actually we can work with anything, right? So this is sort of what we have in there. And then you see these queue parameters, and they basically uh, specify the preference, right? So um, because application JSON does not have a queue parameter, it just defaults to one. So this is, in fact, the client that is sending this message with this uh, header is saying, I want to get JSON. Like, that is what I, I would like to get, ideally. But again, if you don't have JSON, my next preference would be for XML. And if you don't have that, then I'm also willing to do, deal with HTML, um, text, and so on and so forth. And um, what you could actually do is uh, maybe one time in your browser, look at what the accept header is by default. And the browsers are also quite lenient because obviously a browser is willing to deal with HTML, but it also is able to uh, uh, render out a PNG file and things like that. Um, so uh, the accept header of a browser usually looks like it's going to accept HTML. Um, if you don't have XML, it's also going to accept uh, images. And you know, at worst case, it's just going to try to accept anything and try to render it out. Now, the tricky bit is that there is, in fact, actually no specification that defines how a server is supposed to deal with an accept header. It basically is the client is like, I would like to have this. But then the server can say, actually, I don't have JSON, I don't have HTML, actually, I can only do PNG, right? And then, or actually, I can do PNG, but if you insist, I guess I could also do JSON, right? But I really wanted to return a PNG. And then how do you reconcile the preferences here? Like, how do the prefer preferences of the client and the server come together? And you would need to have an algorithm for that, and there is no defined algorithm for this. There's no RC that defines that. What's, what's kind of useful, though, is that there's this um, Apache module, mod negotiation, and they've gone to great lengths to really document well how they do it. So that could be like a role model of how you also might want to do um, this sort of negotiation. Um, in uh, the first rest bundle, we're leveraging um, a library called negotiation that William uh, authored. Um, and uh, here we are, we're trying to, you know, um, or we offer one implementation. So given that accept header that I just explained, um, you can define rules by path. So this here says, um, this rule here or this configuration here in the rest bundle will say for all the routes, because it's basically just on slash, um, I have the priorities uh, HTML, JSON, and XML. So these are the three formats I'm willing to deal with. Um, you can define a fallback format um, if no match can be found. And here we're also saying that um, we're actually also looking at the, the extension. 
So, um, so if somebody says articles.json, we would also support that. I would generally not recommend to enable that, um, so I would generally keep that to false. Again, because you don't want to have multiple URLs for the same resource. Now, given these priorities, what it's going to look at is going to look at, um, it's going to create groups of preferences. Um, so here we saw the first group sort of of preference would be application JSON, and it's going to look if it finds application JSON anywhere within the priorities. It does find it. So in this case, if you would send that accept header, it's going to say, okay, the request response should be JSON, right? Um, if we wouldn't have JSON in there in the priorities, then the next uh, uh, preferred option would be XML, so that would be what uh, we would set as a response format. Um, this entire topic of content negotiation, I don't, this solution is okay. I, I still hope that we can do better. Um, because uh, I would ideally want to actually more closely uh, configure these accept headers on the, the controller rather than on you know, this global configuration file. And uh, more specifically, if you do API versioning, you should also ideally uh, use media types rather than trying to embed the, URL, uh, the version within the URL. Because again, then you would have like slash v1 slash articles, which would seem to be something different than slash v2 slash articles. And again, you would not have unique uh, identifiers. This is something that we're working on um, quite intensively, actually. And hopefully, we'll soon have a solution. Um, but right now, it's. I would basically recommend if you need, want to do media type based uh, content negotiation for versioning, you would have to write a custom uh, listener um, to deal with that. All right, so far, so much about that. I think for anybody that hasn't heard about this, this might be a little bit much to just grasp it in these short words. Uh, I hope maybe you, you understand a little bit what it's about and, uh, and then continue reading. There are lots of re resources on the web to get more information about content type negotiation and media types. Okay, so this figure is called the Richardson Maturity Model. And this model is a way to grade your API according to the constraints of REST. Uh, so there are four levels, and the higher the better. In the previous part of this talk, um, you, you can access level one and level two, but in order to build truly REST API, you must at least um, access level three. It's a precondition. Level three is called hypermedia controls and uses something called HATOS. HATOS stands for hypermedia as the engine of application state and the, the idea is to provide relations or hypertext links to your API responses. In theory, it's about the discoverability of actions on a resource, but in practice, it's more a way to document your, your API through its responses. So in Symfony 2 we, and in PHP, we have a new library called A2S with its bundle called the Basinga A2S bundle. That's a library Adrian Bro and I um, have, created, have created. And it basically leveraged the JMS stylizer library by hooking it to it. Um, we relies on the last Symfony 2 component named expression language uh, we the, the library supports JSON and XML, just like the JMS Sarizer. And you can configure relations that are either links, so URIs, or embedded resources in XML, YAML, PHP, or annotations. Embedded resources are like resources embedded in a main resource. The, the idea behind embedded resources is that you have a clear separation between your resources. And you can also dynamically add relations to any API response so that you can um, generate relation and add them at runtime. And we also provide um, a feature for exclusion strategies such as uh, don't 
um, add this link if the object is null, for instance. So here is an example. So it's a user class with the serializer configuration. And in order to add a relation, you just have to, to add an annotation or something else. And a relation is an is name. So the name is the is self here. And it's a link relation because of the href parameter. It would be a embedded resource if you would use the embed parameter. So here you you have a href well, a href value with a special function called exp and exp is all a to s um, um, rely on the expression language. Okay. So adding this link, this adding this link, this relation will give you the following JSON content. So it's uh, HAL format. HAL stands for Hypertext Application Language. And you will get a, the, the classic properties, but also a underscore links key with the self um, relation. So the expression language above just concatenates slash API slash user slash and the object's ID, which is the user ID. And then with user one, two, three, you will get slash API slash user slash one, two, three, okay? In XML, you will get a, an, a link tag, which is a atom link, okay? By now, the A2S library only supports HAL format and XML through Atom links. But now that you can add links to your API responses, <coughs> what you, want, you, are, you may want to do is to tell your clients or to build uh, URIs to use your API, such as uh, which parameter you, or which parameters are available in the query string or things like that. And there is a bundle for that called the templated URI bundle. And this bundle provides a router and a URL generator um, for creating URI templates. A URI template is um, described in RFC 6570. And it's basically a compact sequence of character for describing a range of UIs through variable expansion. Let's take an example. So on the left, you have two URLs. So example.com slash tilde threads slash and example.com slash tilde mark slash. Uh, these are URLs for personal web spaces on Unix system. And the corresponding UI template would be example.com slash tilde username between curly braces slash. In the bundle provides a new router available as a service. And in order to generate a UI template, you just have to call the generate method, just like the classic Symfony 2 router with a set of parameters. So to, you, have, you can replace the, the required par placeholder, part of the pattern of the root, but also add extra parameters, part of the query string, such as the sort parameter, which is a simple parameter, or the filter parameter, which is in this case an array. Person 5B, person 5D are square brackets. But the bundle, the Bazinga A2S bundle and this bundle, the templated URL bundle, are good for providing documentation to your API responses. But such a documentation is just for you, uh, it's just for software, for your clients. However, one thing that could be nice would be to provide documentation for humans. And that's why there is a bundle called Nelmio API Doc Bundle. The idea of this bundle is to generate documentation for REST APIs in an automatic way. 
So it gathers information from PHPDoc and various uh, other um, places. For instance, by supporting a widely range of um, a wide range of bundles, such as the Postgres bundle, the Sensio for Microsoft bundle, and so on. You can also support your own annotation or create your own parsers to, to get uh, more information uh, depending on your application. And there is also a sandbox, which is for a given endpoint, you get a form and an interface to test your API. Your API, the, each endpoint can be tested to a specific interface. It automatically builds a form and then you can fill parameters and, and test it and get the response and so on. Uh, it's worth mentioning that this bundle has been developed by a company and is well integrated with the other parts of um, the of the ecosystem, the Symfony 2 ecosystem. So there is a real a real solution for REST um, application in the Symfony 2 ecosystem. It's not just different um, layers. There is a real stack that is really consistent. So here is a, an example again. So it's a, an action with a PHP doc, list all nodes. There are three annotations. Two of them are the query parameters, part of the first rest bundle. And the Nelmeo API doc bundle provides its own annotation that contains a lot of parameters. So here we just configure that it's a resource and a status code. And by with this example, you you'll get the following interface. So now you know that you have a single endpoint slash node that is available using the get HTTP method. You can find you can retrieve the PHP doc the list all nodes. Uh, on the right of the endpoint or in the documentation section. And then you get um, the requirements and filters. Requirements are um, mandatory parameters, part of the routing definition, and filters are parameters part of the query string. So the query parameters part of the FOS REST bundle uh, come here. And it's time for the demo. Yes. So uh, we've, seen, uh, we've seen all these different pieces, how they work together, uh, sort of in theory. Um, and uh, actually, um, someone from Berlin has created a nice Symphony REST edition. So basically, they took the, the Symphony 2 REST edition, and then, uh, sorry, the Symphony Standard Edition, and then added all these different bundles. Uh, as presentation, uh, preparation for this talk, we actually upgraded it to Symphony 2.3 and added a couple of bundles and lots of examples. So. Um, um, but if you're interested, it's basically github.com slash gimler and then symphony dash rest edition. I'm not sure yet if it's in the distribution section of symphony.com yet. Uh, but yeah, um, that's if you want to play around with rest APIs and all these bundles that we've been talking about and even some more, um, then uh, do check that out. But um, yeah, let's have a brief look at um, what you can do with it. So, um, so here we basically, um, you know, we have an HTML interface. Uh, we can remove things, uh, we can create new nodes, uh, messages in this case, um, you know, and all that works uh, quite nicely. Here I've enabled this uh, extension support, so if I do go to .json, then I get a JSON representation here. Uh, you can also see now the link relations um, that are added. Um, we also see, uh, you know, we can go to .xml, uh, get the XML representation of this. Um, so all that works quite nicely. Um, now, um, you know, ah, I have to get out of the... Now let me briefly show you how, how that actually is implemented. Um, so we have this controller here. Um, let's try to make this a little bit wider here. And uh, this controller, um, um, in this example, and I think that's important to explain that people don't get confused, 
In order to not require a database for this example, we basically were just using a session for storing as you're adding messages and things like that. But it's not required at all to use sessions for REST. And generally, if you're doing a REST API, you actually want to be stateless. You don't want to use sessions and things like that. But um, yeah. Anyway, so we have um, you know we have this get notes uh, method here. We have um, uh, get node action here. This is the getter uh, for a specific node. And I can briefly show you. Um, so if you go to app console router debug, if you don't know this command yet, um, learn to love it. Um, and all these different actions that we defined, they automatically generate these routes right here, right? So we have you know a post, uh, we have a put, we have delete, and all these different routes. They're generated by looking at these method names and by the fact that we have, I hope it's in this file. No, I'm looking at, no, actually it is. Yeah. So here we define that we want to look at this controller here and then a type rest. And with that is going to, when you first load your Symphony 2 application, it's going to look at that controller, parse out all the method names and generate the routes automatically for you. Now, um, again, what we can see here is that we have no specific logic that deals with HTML or JSON. That's all, all we have to do is we have to return uh, a specific type of uh, class, and then uh, based on the JMS serializer mapping, it's going to know how to serialize that out. Um, right. Um, same thing if you want to deal with forms, no problem. Uh, we just accept the form. Uh, check if it is valid, um, and then um, what's interesting here is that we have this speci special uh, route redirect uh, method here. Uh, you can also use that manually, but the idea here is that in s with the first rest bundle, there is this situation oftentimes if you have a form on an HTML or an HTML form that when people submit that, then you're creating a new resource, for example. Um, and then it's common practice to then redirect to that new resource. Um, so you know, you're creating your, um, your new message and then you redirect to that new resource that was created. Um, now, and if you have a JSON or an XML or REST API in general, you don't actually want to redirect to that new resource. You just want to set a location header in the response to say, now if you want to get that new resource, here's the location for it. And with the root redirect um, uh, class, actually you can automate that. Based on configuration, you can define for which formats it should actually redirect immediately, uh, do like a 300 response, and for which uh, it should just set the location header. Um, so there are all these little details in the first rest bundle that enable you to have a single uh, action that can deal both for uh, HTML as well as for your REST API. Um, yeah. Now, um, maybe, uh, maybe you can explain a little bit how the mapping works, um, both for the hate OS bundle and the JMS serializer. Okay. So, we decided to configure the serializer and hate OS in YAML. So, yeah. So, we, re we used a Extrusion strategy here. So the the this is the one of the basic extrusion strategy, which say by default exclude all properties and we will expose them uh, property by property using the export true parameter. Um, we have seen that that before it's uh, XML configuration for it, it's a specific configuration for XML. So here we say that nodes are inlined and the entry name for each node is node. Um, we also say that offset and limit are XML attributes. So we'll come as attribute on the, X, on the node tags. And then A2S reused the, the same configuration file and here all this section is re related to the A2S library. So we can configure relations such as a, both are link relation actually. So the first one is the self relation. So we can use a root rather than a R-coded value. So 
this root will under the hood reuse the root uh, the Symfony two router and then generate well the the URL generator part of the Symfony router and then generate the um, the root. You can decide to either create a absolute or relative URI. And then we have another link relation that use a different generator. Actually, it, it uses the templated URI generator, part of the templated URI bundle. So both the templated URI bundle and the I2S bundle are linked together. So that's specific configuration for the, so this generator. And on each relation, you can add uh, attributes. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then you, you'll get these two links. So in XML, you get um, link tags that are atom links. And then there is the self relation. And then the not relation that is a URI template. And here is our custom attribute. Let's try to change something like making this URI relative, and then you go. Okay. So that's the same thing for the other um, resources. Uh, here we are using the exp function to rely on the um, expression language. So in A2S, by default, you get this special object variable that represents the, the current instance. The, so here, the current node. And then you can call method or everything you want on it. Uh, here is a little another, um, another expression function. And Jason, for mm -hmm. instance, Should, nope. Let's go back to the collection. Wait. Oh, uh, we don't have one. Uh -huh. So need to add one. Let's add one then. Hop. Create. Hero. Nope. Add. Hero. No. So we have the message and the links, and there are no issues in even. Ah, no big. Ah, looks like we broke something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we should get, uh, ah, no, maybe it's because we need to create another node because things are, are good, I guess. So, Symfony, why? Something like that. Okay. No. So, um, Just go a little slower. Yeah. But hop. Hop. Nope. Jason. Ha. Ah. There. Here are the the embedded resources. So we use the X function that gets the associated events relation. So. Everywhere in the A2S configuration, every time you have to put a value, you can either use a R-coded value or an expression for, for with the expression language. So we configure this, the relation name using an expression and the embedded resources using an expression as well. And yeah, there was an exclusion strategy. If it was, there is no, there was no embedded resources in the, pre in the previous node because of this exclusion strategy. If the ID was, was zero, we, we decided to hide the, the embedded resources. And so now you get the associated event. And that's okay. I guess we, are, we only have like six minutes left. So if there are any questions, we can answer questions. Otherwise, we can actually have more slides. Anyway, okay, yes. 
Oh yeah. Uh, basically, uh, the question about the last slides. Uh, well, in my s small opinion, uh, using expressions in the YAML file kind of creates a unattractable mess. Well, in my opinion, uh, what would be a good alternative, and uh, how can that be used? I, I, the alternative would actually be to uh, instead of having that in the configuration file, you can all. Of course, also access uh, the different services that are managing H the H2S library and things like that, and you could write code like that also into your controller. So that's, that's also possible, uh, but it's, it's going to write, require more code. Um, but yeah, I agree that there is a danger with the expression language in general, and that's actually something that, you know, it's not only in this specific use case, but in all use cases, obviously, the more logic you start adding to your configuration, uh, there's a certain danger there, absolutely. So I agree that there is danger, and I wouldn't overuse this. And maybe there's everybody needs to find what their taste is, how far to go with that. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, you can use um, the relation provider feature and add a method to your to your resource class, so to your model classes, and create relation in raw PHP. And so you would use YAML, the YAML configuration to to tell uh, the library where to find this relation provider. So basically, it's a, a callback. So, and then it will use the, the, PHP, um, the PHP configuration rather than the YAML. Otherwise, I guess the expression language is fine in annotations, and it's the preferred way to, to configure I2S. But also note that when you you decide to you have to use the same format between the serializer and I2S configuration. Thank you. Any more questions? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you for the speech. <coughs> William, do you have a success experience to build RESTful IP following domain driving design ideas? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, um, the thing is, um, REST APIs are most of the time, represented create applications, create read update delete, and it doesn't fit well with the DDD fi philosophy. So that even if you can use a REST API for the presentation layer part of the DDD model, it's not the best. Well, we don't play well together actually. I will try to to go to in this direction in my blog post series, but I will explain why it's not really a good idea to mix both concepts at the same time. How would you handle API versioning, for example, if a model has different properties and different versions of the API? So that's actually another cool feature from JMS Serializer. There are actually annotations where you can say ver since version this or until version that, and then you can just call set version on the the serializer, and again, the force rest bundle actually makes it easier to do that, um, um, so you don't actually have to inject the serializer to do this. Um, so yeah, um, in many, many cases, you can uh, just do the entire differences um, within the, the, how the things are serialized. Obviously, if you have difference in logic and your controllers need to be different, then it gets iffy because that's kind of what I explained right now. We don't really have a good solution to, for the same URL pattern or same route to determine automatically which controller to actually use. So we are exp there, are, there are about four different pull requests open on the first REST bundle again, experimenting with different approaches. I'm not sure yet if we're going to find a generic solution. Maybe we can just explain how to do a custom solution, and then in the end, most cases, you will actually write your own listener. Now, that being said, I think too many people are, um, are, are missing or are not thinking much ahead. So you need to think about what, how you're going to evolve your API, how that, and you should think about that. Actually, I, I recently blogged about this on my blog, putiweed.org. There's another link there to uh, a post about API evolution, and there's a much more detail than I have actually in my blog about how to do forwards compatibility, how to think about that. And actually, I want to mention one thing. Um, so when most people are talking about REST APIs today, they think JSON. 
And um, personally, I think JSON is actually a bad format. Um, because um, uh, it is, you're, you're the, it's very hard to evolve um, an API. So let's say you have um, an a REST API for a shop, and you have products, and products have one price, right? So you have, in your JSON response, you have price equal that, right? And then maybe you have currency equal that. Now, imagine you want to add another currency. Now, how do you do that? Now, I don't know, do you have prices underscore US dollar, or I don't know? Or you do prices, so your truck just changes and your API is broken. With XML, you have a prices tag with an attribute for currency, and then you, have, you just add another prices tag. Your API is not broken. There's no reason to increase the version, right? Um, and the other thing that people always forget about versioning is that maybe you don't even want people to use your old version, right? So kill them. Right. I mean, uh, I mean, it's it's okay to increase sort of the like the media type, increase the version there, but I don't know. Do you really want to maintain that? All right. Um, more questions. I think there was one over here. Okay. Was it n any other questions? Yes. You tell us a little bit uh, more about because that I don't, it, it doesn't look like that has been really covered about that some kind of te caching techniques for the uh, REST server response and so on. Oh yeah, we got you covered. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a bundle for that. Surprise! <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> so leap cache control bundle. Um, so obviously, when you're doing uh, uh, when you want to do caching in with Symphony two. We have very, very powerful support in the response for setting cache headers. Um, and you can do that within your controller, of course. You can manually set that. Now, um, what, is kinda, what we created with this leap cache control bundle was the concept that sometimes you don't want to actually manage that within your controllers, but you actually want to do that as part of your configuration. So similar to how you're doing uh, um, uh, the configuration for the firewall by, based on path, you can also set cache headers based on path and you can just uh, it uses the, the core request matcher, so you can have you specify on path, HTTP method, request attributes, and things like that. You can automatically add uh, cache response headers. Um, so uh, I can actually show, how, show you how that looks. Um, so here I have a request, and that sets this cache, cache header here, and that is based on this configuration right here. Uh, here. So here we say for nodes, if the method is get uh, or head, we will automatically add these cache headers here. Um, and I think that's actually quite cool to separate that from your controller. Um, however, obviously, this does not work for all cases. So for example, if you're looking at um, ETAC e -tag handling and things like that, that's not covered by this bundle, and you will always need to have some logic within your controller most likely to determine, is that ETAG um, actually identifying that you, you can just return the response again um, or you have to ge regenerate it. So it doesn't s cover all the cases, but it actually helps in a lot of cases. Um, this bundle does a lot more as well, helping especially integrating with Varnish uh, and things like that. Yeah. Okay, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. Is somebody going to kick us out or we just keep going? Okay. So, uh, apart from th thank you, uh, I wanted to ask about how you, uh, you uh, what is the support of link method in REST bundle? Because I know uh, uh, William elaborated a lot uh, on this and uh, brought uh, great implementation in his blog, but it was uh, like a part of. Well, the thing is, uh, nowadays link is no more a a supported. Um, HTTP method, it's not part of, the, of any RFC um, at the moment. So it's a bit tricky to add li link support to the A4S REST bundle, but there is also a bundle for that, which is called the Bazinga REST Extra bundle, which is basically my playground for REST things that are not part of A4S REST bundle yet. So there is a link request listener that handles pretty much everything I explain in my blog post about REST APIs the right way with Symfony 2. 
and it does much more things than a year ago. So yeah, you should you should really try this this bundle. It's almost stable, and the the links request listener works well. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, if there are any more questions, we will be around. Uh, I hope at least several of you will also be at the Hack Day on Saturday. Then we can even talk even more. But I think now it's time to eat. So thank you very yeah. much. For thank listening. you.